This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.blogsome.com. This reading by Gordon Mackenzie. International Episode by Henry James. LibriVox section number two. The two young Englishmen inaugurated the policy of not resisting Mrs. Westgate by submitting with great docility and thankfulness to her husband. He was evidently a very good fellow, and he made an impression upon his visitors. His hospitality seemed to recommend itself consciously, with a friendly wink, as it were, as if it hinted, judicially, that you could not possibly make a better bargain. Lord Lambeth and his cousin left their entertainer to his labors, and returned to their hotel, where they spent three or four hours in their respective shower-baths. Percy Beaumont had suggested that they ought to see something of the town. But, oh, damn the town, his noble kinsman had rejoined. They returned to Mr. Westgate's office in a carriage, with their luggage, very punctually. But it must be reluctantly recorded that, this time, he kept them waiting so long that they felt themselves missing the steamer, and were deterred only by an amiable modesty from dispensing with his attendance, and starting on a hasty scramble to the wharf. But when at last he appeared, and the carriage plunged into the purlieu of Broadway, they jolted and jostled to such good purpose that they reached the huge white vessel, while the bell for departure was still ringing, and the absorption of passengers still active. It was, indeed, as Mr. Westgate had said, a big boat, and his leadership in the innumerable and interminable corridors and cabins, with which he seemed perfectly acquainted, and of which anyone and everyone appeared to have the entree, was very grateful to the slightly bewildered voyagers. He showed them their stateroom, a spacious apartment embellished with gas lamps, mirrors on pied, and sculptured furniture and then, long after they had been intimately convinced that the steamer was in motion and launched upon the unknown stream that they were about to navigate, he bade them a sociable farewell. "'Well, good-bye, Lord Lambeth,' he said. "'Good-bye, Mr. Percy Beaumont. I hope you'll have a good time. Just let them do what they want with you. I'll come down by and by and look after you.' The young Englishmen emerged from their cabin and amused themselves with wandering about the immense labyrinthine steamer, which struck them as an extraordinary mixture of a ship and a hotel. It was densely crowded with passengers, the large number of whom appeared to be ladies and very young children. And in the big saloons, ornamented in white and gold, which followed each other in surprising succession, beneath the swinging gaslight, and among the small side passages, where the negro domestics of both sexes assembled with an air of philosophic leisure, everyone was moving to and fro, and exchanging loud and familiar observations. Eventually, at the insistence of a discriminating black, our young men went and had some supper, in a wonderful place arranged like a theatre, where, in a gilded gallery, upon which little boxes appeared to open, a large orchestra was playing operatic selections, and below people were handing out bills of fare, as if they had been programs. All this was sufficiently curious, but the agreeable thing, later, was to sit out on one of the great white decks of the steamer, in the warm breezy darkness, and in the vague starlight, to make out the line of low mysterious coast. The young Englishman tried American cigars, those of Mr. Westgate, and talked together as they usually talked, with many odd silences, lapses of logic, and incongruities of transition, like people who have grown old together and learned to supply each other's missing phrases, or, more especially, like people thoroughly conscious of a common point of view, so that a style of conversation superficially lacking in finish might suffice for reference to a fund of associations in the light of which everything was all right. "'We really seem to be going out to sea,' Percy Beaumont observed. "'Upon my word we are going back to England. He has shipped us off again. I call that real mean.' "'I suppose it's all right,' said Lord Lambeth. "'I want to see those pretty girls at Newport. 
You know he told us that the place was an island, and aren't all islands in the sea? Well, resumed the elder traveller after a while, if his house is as good as his cigars, we shall do very well. He seems a very good fellow, said Lord Lambeth, as if this idea had just occurred to him. I say, we had better remain at the inn, rejoined his companion presently. I don't think I like the way he spoke of his house. I don't like stopping in the house with such a tremendous lot of women. Oh, I don't mind, said Lord Lambeth, and then they smoked a while in silence. Fancy his thinking we do no work in England, the young man resumed. I dare say he didn't really think so, said Percy Beaumont. Well, I guess they don't know much about England over here, declared Lord Lambeth humorously, and then there was another long pause. He was devilishly civil, observed the young nobleman. Nothing certainly could have been more civil, rejoined his companion. Littledale said his wife was great fun, said Lord Lambeth. Whose wife? Littledale's? This American's, Mrs. Westgate, what was his name? J. L. Beaumont was silent a moment. What was fun to Littledale, he said at last, rather sententiously, may be death to us. What do you mean by that? asked his kinsman. I am as good a man as Littledale? My dear boy, I hope you won't begin to flirt, said Percy Beaumont. I don't care. I dare say I shan't begin. With a married woman, if she's bent upon it, it's all very well, Beaumont expounded. But our friend mentioned a young lady, a sister, a sister-in-law. For God's sake, don't get entangled with her. How do you mean, entangled? Depend upon it, she will try to hook you. Oh, bother, said Lord Lambeth. American girls are very clever, urged his companion. So much the better, the young man declared. I fancy they are always up to some game of that sort, Beaumont continued. They can't be worse than they are in England, said Lord Lambeth judicially. Ah, but in England, replied Beaumont. You have got your natural protectors. You have got your mothers and sisters. My mothers and sisters, began the young nobleman with a certain energy, but he stopped in time, puffing at his cigar. Your mother spoke to me about it with tears in her eyes, said Percy Beaumont. She said she felt very nervous. I promised to keep you out of mischief. You had better take care of yourself said the object of maternal and ducal solicitude. Ah, rejoined the young barrister, I haven't the expectation of a hundred thousand a year, not to mention other attractions. Well, said Lord Lambeth, don't cry out before you're hurt. It was certainly very much cooler at Newport, where our travellers found themselves assigned to a couple of diminutive bedrooms in a faraway angle of an immense hotel. They had gone ashore in the early summer twilight, and had very promptly put themselves to bed, thanks to which circumstance, and to their having, during the previous hours in their commodious cabin, slept the sleep of youth and health, they began to feel, toward eleven o'clock, very alert and inquisitive. They looked out of their windows across a row of small green fields, bordered with low stone walls of rude construction, and saw a deep blue ocean lying beneath a deep blue sky, and flecked now and then with scintillating patches of foam. A strong, fresh breeze came in through the curtainless casements, and prompted our young men to observe, generally, that it didn't seem half a bad climate. They made other observations after they had emerged from their rooms in pursuit of breakfast, a meal of which they partook in a huge bare hall, where a hundred negroes in white jackets were shuffling about upon an uncarpeted floor, where the flies were superabundant, and the tables and dishes covered over with a strange voluminous integument of coarse blue gauze, and where several little boys and girls, who had risen late, were seated in fastidious solitude at the morning repast. These young persons had not the morning paper before them, but they were engaged in languid perusal of the bill of fare. 
This latter document was a great puzzle to our friends, who, on reflecting that its bewildering categories had relation to breakfast alone, had an uneasy prevision of an encyclopedic dinner list. They found a great deal of entertainment at the hotel, an enormous wooden structure, for the erection of which it seemed to them that the virgin forests of the West must have been terribly deflowered. It was perforated from end to end with immense bare corridors, through which a strong draught was blowing, bearing along wonderful figures of ladies in white morning dresses and clouds of Valencian lace, who seemed to float down the long vistas with expanded fur belows, like angels spreading their wings. In front was a gigantic veranda, upon which an army might have encamped, a vast wooden terrace with a roof as lofty as the nave of a cathedral. Here our young Englishmen enjoyed, as they supposed, a glimpse of American society, which was distributed over the measureless expanse in a variety of sedentary attitudes, and appeared to consist largely of pretty young girls, dressed as if for a fête champette, swaying to and fro in rocking chairs, fanning themselves with large straw fans, and enjoying an enviable exemption from social cares. Lord Lambeth had a theory, which it might be interesting to trace to its origin, that it would be not only agreeable, but easily possible, to enter into relations with one of these young ladies, and his companion, as he had done a couple of days before, found occasion to check the young nobleman's colloquial impulses. "'You had better take care,' said Percy Beaumont, "'or you will have an offended father or brother pulling out a bowie-knife. "'Well, I assure you it is all right,' Lord Lambeth replied. "'You know the Americans come to these big hotels to make acquaintances.' "'I know nothing about it, and neither do you,' said his kinsman, who, like a clever man, had begun to perceive that the observation of American society demanded a readjustment of one's standard. "'Hang it! Then let's find out!' cried Lord Lambeth, with some impatience. "'You know I don't want to miss anything.' "'We will find out,' said Percy Beaumont very reasonably. "'We will go and see Mrs. Westgate and make all proper inquiries.' And so the two inquiring Englishmen, who had this lady's address inscribed in her husband's hand upon a card, descended from the veranda of the big hotel, and took their way, according to direction, along a large straight road, past a series of fresh-looking villas, embosomed in shrubs and flowers, and enclosed in an ingenious variety of wooden palings. The morning was brilliant and cool. The villas were smart and snug, and the walk of the young travellers was very entertaining. Everything looked as if it had received a coat of fresh paint the day before. The red roofs, the green shutters, the clean bright browns and buffs of the house-fronts. The flower-beds on the little lawns seemed to sparkle in the radiant air, and the gravel in the short carriage-sweeps to flash and twinkle. Along the road came a hundred little basket phaetons, in which, almost always, a couple of ladies were sitting, ladies in white dresses and long white gloves, holding the reins and looking at the two Englishmen, whose nationality was not elusive, through thick blue veils, tied tightly about their faces as if to guard their complexions. At last the young men came within sight of the sea again, and then, having interrogated a gardener over the paling of a villa, they turned into an open gate. Here they found themselves face to face with the ocean and with a very picturesque structure, resembling a magnified chalet, which was perched upon a green embankment just above it. The house had a veranda of extraordinary width all around it, and a great many doors and windows standing open to the veranda. These various apertures had, in common, such an accessible, hospitable air, such a breezy flutter within of light curtains, such expansive thresholds, and reassuring interiors, that our friends hardly knew which was the regular entrance, and, after hesitating a moment, presented themselves at one of the windows. The room within was dark, but in a moment a graceful figure vaguely shaped itself in the rich-looking gloom, and a lady came to meet them. Then they saw that she had been seated at a table writing, 
and that she had heard them and had got up. She stepped out into the light. She wore a frank, charming smile, with which she held out her hand to Percy Beaumont. "'Oh, you must be Lord Lambeth and Mr. Beaumont,' she said. "'I have heard from my husband that you had come. I am extremely glad to see you.' And she shook hands with each of her visitors. Her visitors were a little shy, but they had very good manners. They responded with smiles and exclamations, and they apologized for not knowing the front door. The lady rejoined with vivacity that when she wanted to see people very much, she did not insist upon those distinctions, and that Mr. Westgate had written to her of his English friends in terms that made her really anxious. "'He said you were terribly prostrated,' said Mrs. Westgate. "'Oh, you mean by the heat,' replied Percy Beaumont. "'We were rather knocked up, but we feel wonderfully better. We had such a jolly, uh, voyage down here. It's so very good of you to mind.' "'Yes, it's so very kind of you,' murmured Lord Lambeth. Mrs. Westgate stood smiling. She was extremely pretty. "'Well, I did mind,' she said, "'and I thought of sending for you this morning to the Ocean House. I am very glad you are better, and I am charmed you have arrived. You must come round to the other side of the piazza.' And she led the way, with a light, smooth step, looking back at the young men and smiling. The other side of the piazza was, as Lord Lambeth presently remarked, a very jolly place. It was of the most liberal proportions, and with its awnings, its fanciful chairs, its cushions and rugs, its view of the ocean close at hand, tumbling along the base of the low cliffs whose level tops intervened in lawn-like smoothness, it formed a charming complement to the drawing-room. As such, it was in course of use at the present moment. It was occupied by a social circle. There were several ladies, and two or three gentlemen to whom Mrs. Westgate proceeded to introduce the distinguished strangers. She mentioned a great many names very freely and distinctly. The young Englishmen, shuffling about and bowing, were rather bewildered. But at last they were provided with chairs, low wicker chairs, gilded and tied with a great many ribbons. And one of the ladies, a very young person with a little snub nose and several dimples, offered Percy Beaumont a fan. The fan was also adorned with pink love-knots. But Percy Beaumont declined it, although he was very hot. Presently, however, it became cooler. The breeze from the sea was delicious, the view was charming, and the people sitting there looked exceedingly fresh and comfortable. Several of the ladies seemed to be young girls, and the gentlemen were slim, fair youths such as our friends had seen the day before in New York. The ladies were working upon bands of tapestry, and one of the young men had an open book in his lap. Beaumont afterward learned from one of the ladies that this young man had been reading aloud, that he was from Boston, and was very fond of reading aloud. Beaumont said it was a great pity that they had interrupted him. He should like so much, from all he had heard, to hear a Bostonian read, couldn't the young man be induced to go on? Oh, no, said his informant very freely. He won't be able to get the young ladies to attend to him now. There was something very friendly, Beaumont perceived, in the attitude of the company. They looked at the young Englishman with an air of animated sympathy and interest. They smiled brightly and unanimously at everything either of their visitors said. Lord Lambeth and his companion felt that they were being made very welcome. Mrs. Westgate seated herself between them, and, talking a great deal to each, they had occasion to observe that she was as pretty as their friend Littledale had promised. She was thirty years old, with the eyes and smile of a girl of seventeen, and she was extremely light and graceful, elegant, exquisite. Mrs. Westgate was extremely spontaneous. She was very frank and demonstrative, and appeared always while she looked at you delightedly with her beautiful young eyes, to be making sudden confessions and concessions after momentary hesitations. "'We shall expect to see a great deal of you,' she said to Lord Lambeth with a kind of joyous earnestness. "'We are very fond of Englishmen here. That is, there are a great many we have been fond of. After a day or two you must come and stay with us. 
We hope you will stay a long time. Newport's a very nice place when you come really to know it, when you know plenty of people. Of course, you and Mr. Beaumont will have no difficulty about that. Englishmen are very well received here. There are almost always two or three of them about. I think they always like it, and I must say I should think they would. They receive ever so much attention. I must say I think they sometimes get spoiled. Oh, but I am sure you and Mr. Beaumont are proof against that. My husband tells me you are a friend of Captain Littledale. He was such a charming man. He made himself most agreeable here, and I am sure I wonder he didn't stay. It couldn't have been pleasanter for him in his own country, though I suppose it is very pleasant in England, for English people. I don't know myself. I have been there very little. I have been a great deal abroad, but I am always on the continent. I must say I am extremely fond of Paris. You know we Americans always are. We go there when we die. Did you ever hear that before? That was said by a great wit. I, I mean the good Americans. <laughs> but we are all good. You'll see that for yourself. All I know of England is London. And all I know of London is that place on that little corner, you, you know, where you buy jackets. Jackets with that coarse braid and those big buttons. They make very good jackets in London. I will do you the justice to say that. And some people like the hats. But about the hats, I was always a heretic. I always got my hats in Paris. You can't wear an English hat, at least I never could, unless you dress your hair à l'anglaise. And I must say, that is a talent I have never possessed. In Paris they will make things to suit your peculiarities. But in England I think you like much more to have, how shall I say it, one thing for everybody. I mean as regards dress. I don't know about other things, but I have always supposed that in other things everything was different. I mean, according to the people, according to the classes, and all that. I'm afraid you will think that I don't take a very favorable view, but you know you can't take a very favorable view in Dover Street in the month of November. That has always been my fate. Do you know Jones's Hotel in Dover Street? That's all I know of England. Of course, everyone admits that the English hotels are your weak point. There was always the most frightful fog. I couldn't see to try my things on. When I got over to America, into the light, I usually found they were twice too big. The next time I mean to go in the season, I think I shall go next year. I want very much to take my sister. She has never been to England. I don't know whether you know what I mean by saying that the Englishmen who come here sometimes get spoiled. I mean that they take things as a matter of course. Things are done for them. Now, naturally, they are only a matter of course when the Englishmen are very nice. But, of course, they are almost always very nice. Of course, this isn't nearly such an interesting country as England. There are not nearly so many things to see. And we haven't your country life. I have never seen anything of your country life. When I am in Europe, I am always on the continent. But I have heard a great deal about it. I know that when you are among yourselves in the country, you have the most beautiful time. Of course, we have nothing of that sort. We have nothing on that scale. I don't apologize, Lord Lambeth. Some Americans are always apologizing. You must have noticed that. We have the reputation of always boasting and bragging and waving the American flag. But I must say that what strikes me is that we are perpetually making excuses and trying to smooth things over. The American flag has quite gone out of fashion. It's very carefully folded up like an old tablecloth. Why should we apologize? The English never apologize, do they? No, I must say I never apologize. You must take us as we come, with all our imperfections on our heads. Of course, we haven't your country life, and your old ruins, and your great estates, and your leisure class, and all that. But if we haven't, I should think you might find it a pleasant change. I think any country is pleasant, where they have pleasant manners. Captain Littledale told me he had never seen such pleasant manners as at Newport, and he had been a great deal in European society. Hadn't he been in the diplomatic service? He told me the dream of his life was to get appointed to a diplomatic post in Washington. But he doesn't seem to have succeeded. 
I suppose that in England promotion, and all that sort of thing, is fearfully slow. With us, you know, it's a great deal too fast. You see, I admit our drawbacks. But I must confess, I think Newport is an ideal place. I don't know anything like it anywhere. Captain Littledale told me he didn't know anything like it anywhere. It's entirely different from most watering places. It's a most charming life. I must say, I think that when one goes to a foreign country, one ought to enjoy the differences. Of course, there are differences. Otherwise, what did one come abroad for? Look for your pleasure in the differences, Lord Lambeth. That's the way to do it. And then I am sure you will find American society, at least Newport society, most charming and most interesting. I wish very much my husband were here, but he's dreadfully confined to New York. I suppose you think it's very strange for a gentleman— but, you see, we haven't any leisure class. Mrs. Westgate's discourse, delivered in a soft, sweet voice, flowed on like a miniature torrent, and was interrupted by a hundred little smiles, glances, and gestures, which might have figured the irregularities and obstructions of such a stream. Lord Lambeth listened to her with, it must be confessed, a rather ineffectual attention, although he indulged in a good many little murmurs and ejaculations of assent and deprecation. He had no great faculty of apprehending generalizations. There were some three or four, indeed, which in the play of his own intelligence he had originated, and which had seemed convenient at the moment, but at the present time he could hardly have been said to follow Mrs. Westgate, as she darted gracefully about in the sea of speculation. Fortunately, she asked for no especial rejoinder, for she looked about at the rest of the company as well, and smiled at Percy Beaumont on the other side of her as if he, too, must understand her and agree with her. He was rather more successful than his companion, for besides being, as we know, cleverer, his attention was not vaguely distracted by close vicinity to a remarkably interesting young girl, with dark hair and blue eyes. This was the case with Lord Lambeth, to whom it occurred, after a while, that the young girl, with blue eyes and dark hair, was the pretty sister of whom Mrs. Westgate had spoken. She presently turned to him with a remark which established her identity. "'It's a great pity you couldn't have brought my brother-in-law with you. It's a great shame he should be in New York in these days.' "'Oh, yes, it's so very hot,' said Lord Lambeth. "'It must be dreadful,' said the young girl. "'I dare say he is very busy,' Lord Lambeth observed. "'The gentlemen in America work too much,' the young girl went on. "'Oh?' "'Do they? I dare say they like it,' said her interlocutor. "'I don't like it. One never sees them.' "'Don't you, really?' asked Lord Lambeth. "'I shouldn't have fancied that.' "'Have you come to study American manners?' asked the young girl. "'Oh, I don't know. I just came over for a lark. I haven't got long.' Here there was a pause, and Lord Lambeth began again. But Mr. Westgate will come down here, will it not he? I certainly hope he will. He must help to entertain you and Mr. Beaumont. Lord Lambeth looked at her a little with his handsome brown eyes. Do you suppose he would have come down with us if we had urged him? Mr. Westgate's sister-in-law was silent a moment, and then— I dare say he would, she answered. Really? said the young Englishman. He was immensely civil to Beaumont and me, he added. He is a dear good fellow, the young lady rejoined. And he is a perfect husband. But all Americans are that, she continued, smiling. Really? Lord Lambeth exclaimed again, and wondered whether all American ladies had such a passion for generalizing as these two. He sat there a good while. There was a great deal of talk. It was all very friendly and lively and jolly. Everyone present, sooner or later, said something to him, and seemed to make a particular point of addressing him by name. Two or three other persons came in, and there was a shifting of seats and changing of places. The gentlemen all entered into intimate conversation with the two Englishmen, made them urgent offers of hospitality, and hoped they might frequently be of service to them. They were afraid Lord Lambeth and Mr. Beaumont were not very comfortable at their hotel, that it was not, as one of them said, 
so private as those dear little English inns of yours. This last gentleman went on to say that, unfortunately as yet, perhaps, privacy was not quite so easily obtained in America as might be desired. Still, he continued, you could generally get it by paying for it. In fact, you could get everything in America nowadays by paying for it. American life was certainly growing a great deal more private. It was growing very much like England. Everything at Newport, for instance, was thoroughly private. Lord Lambeth would probably be struck with that. It was also represented to the strangers that it mattered very little whether their hotel was agreeable, as everyone would want them to make visits. They would stay with other people, and in any case they would be a great deal at Mrs. Westgate's. They would find that very charming. It was the pleasantest house in Newport. It was a pity Mr. Westgate was always away. He was a man of the highest ability, very acute, very acute. He worked like a horse, and he left his wife, well, to do about as she liked. He liked her to enjoy herself, and she seemed to know how. She was extremely brilliant and a splendid talker. Some people preferred her sister, but Miss Alden was very different. She was in a different style altogether. Some people even thought her prettier, and certainly she was not so sharp. She was more in the Boston style. She had lived a great deal in Boston, and she was very highly educated. Boston girls, it was propounded, were more like English young ladies. Lord Lambeth had presently a chance to test the truth of this proposition, for on the company rising in compliance with the suggestion from their hostess that they should walk down to the rocks and look at the sea, the young Englishman again found himself, as they strolled across the grass, in proximity to Mrs. Westgate's sister. Though she was but a girl of twenty, she appeared to feel the obligation to exert an active hospitality, and this was perhaps the more to be noticed, as she seemed by nature a reserved and retiring person, and had little of her sister's fraternizing quality. She was perhaps rather too thin, and she was a little pale, but as she moved slowly over the grass, with her arms hanging at her sides, looking gravely for a moment at the sea, and then brightly, for all her gravity, at him, Lord Lambeth thought her at least as pretty as Mrs. Westgate, and reflected that if this was the Boston style, the Boston style was very charming. He thought she looked very clever. He could imagine that she was highly educated, but at the same time she seemed gentle and graceful. For all her cleverness, however, he felt that she had to think a little what to say. She didn't say the first thing that came into her head. He had come from a different part of the world and from a different society, and she was trying to adapt her conversation. The others were scattering themselves near the rocks. Mrs. Westgate had charge of Percy Beaumont. "'Very jolly place, isn't it?' said Lord Lambeth. "'It's a very jolly place to sit.' "'Very charming,' said the young girl. "'I often sit here. There are all kinds of cosy corners, as if they had been made on purpose.' "'Ah, I suppose you have had some of them made,' said the young man. Miss Alden looked at him a moment. "'Oh, no, we have had nothing made. It's pure nature.' I should think you would have a few little benches, rustic seats, and that sort of thing. Might be so jolly to sit there, you know," Lord Lambeth went on. "'I am afraid we haven't so many of those things as you,' said the young girl thoughtfully. "'I dare say you go in for pure nature, as you were saying. Nature over here must be so grand, you know.' And Lord Lambeth looked about him. The little coastline hereabouts was very pretty, but it was not at all grand and Miss Alden appeared to rise to a perception of this fact. "'I'm afraid it seems to you very rough,' she said. "'It's not like the coast scenery in Kingsley's novels.' "'Ah, the novels always overdo it, you know,' Lord Lambeth rejoined. "'You must not go by the novels.' They were wandering about a little on the rocks, and they stopped and looked down into a narrow chasm, where the rising tide made a curious bellowing sound. It was loud enough to prevent their hearing each other, and they stood there for some moments in silence. The young girl looked at her companion, observing him attentively, but covertly, as women, even when very young, know how to do. 
Lord Lambeth repaid observation. Tall, straight, and strong. He was handsome as certain young Englishmen, and certain young Englishmen almost alone are handsome, with a perfect finish of feature and a look of intellectual repose and gentle good temper, which seemed somehow to be consequent upon his well-cut nose and chin, and to speak of Lord Lambeth's expression of intellectual repose is not simply a civil way of saying that he looked stupid. He was evidently not a young man of an irritable imagination. He was not, as he would himself have said, tremendously clever. But though there was a kind of appealing dullness in his eyes, he looked thoroughly reasonable and competent, and his appearance proclaimed that to be a nobleman, an athlete, and an excellent fellow was a sufficiently brilliant combination of qualities. The young girl beside him, it may be attested without further delay, thought him the handsomest young man she had ever seen, and Bessie Alden's imagination, unlike that of her companion, was irritable. He, however, was also making up his mind that she was uncommonly pretty. "'I dare say it's very gay here that you have lots of balls and parties,' he said for if he was not tremendously clever, he rather prided himself on having, with women, a sufficiency of conversation. "'Oh, yes, there is a great deal going on,' Bessie Alden replied. "'There are not so many balls, but there are a good many other things. You will see for yourself. We live rather in the midst of it.' "'It's very kind of you to say that, but I thought you Americans were always dancing.' "'I suppose we dance a good deal, but I've never seen much of it.' We don't do it much, at any rate, in summer, and I am sure, said Bessie Alden, that we don't have so many balls as you have in England. Really? exclaimed Lord Lambeth. Ah, in England it all depends, you know. You will not think much of our gaieties, said the young girl, looking at him with a little mixture of interrogation and decision which was peculiar to her. The interrogation seemed earnest, and the decision seemed arch, but the mixture, at any rate, was charming. Those things with us are much less splendid than in England. Oh, I fancy you don't mean that, said Lord Lambeth, laughing. I assure you I mean everything I say, the young girl declared. Certainly from what I have read about English society it is very different. Ah, well, you know, said her companion. Those things are often described by fellows who know nothing about them. You mustn't mind what you read. Oh, I shall mind what I read, Bessie Alden rejoined. When I read Thackeray and George Eliot, how can I help minding them? Ah, well, Thackeray and George Eliot, said the young nobleman. I haven't read much of them. Don't you suppose they know about society? asked Bessie Alden. Oh, I dare say they know. They were so very clever. But these fashionable novels, said Lord Lambeth, they are awful rot, you know. His companion looked at him a moment with her dark blue eyes, and then she looked down in the chasm where the water was tumbling about. "'Do you mean Mrs. Gore, for instance?' she said presently, raising her eyes. "'I'm afraid I haven't read that either,' was the young man's rejoinder, laughing a little and blushing. "'I am afraid you'll think I'm not very intellectual.' "'Reading Mrs. Gore is no proof of intellect. But I like reading everything about English life, even poor books.' I'm so curious about it. Aren't ladies always curious? asked the young man jestingly. But Bessie Alden appeared to desire to answer his question seriously. I don't think so. I don't think we are enough so, that we care about many things. So it's all the more of a compliment, she added, that I should want to know so much about England. The logic here seemed a little close, but Lord Lambeth, made conscious of a compliment, found his natural modesty just at hand. "'I'm sure you know a great deal more than I do.' "'I really think I know a great deal, for a person who's never been there.' "'Have you really never been there?' cried Lord Lambeth. "'Fancy!' "'Never, except in imagination,' said the young girl. "'Fancy!' repeated her companion. "'But I dare say you'll go soon, won't you?' It's the dream of my life, declared Bessie Alden, smiling. But your sister seems to know a tremendous lot about London, Lord Lambeth went on. 
The young girl was silent a moment. "'My sister and I are two very different persons,' she presently said. "'She has been a great deal in Europe. She has been in England several times. She has known a great many English people.' "'But you must have known some, too,' said Lord Lambeth. "'I don't think that I have ever spoken to one before. You are the first Englishman that, to my knowledge, I have ever talked with.' Bessie Alden made this statement with a certain gravity, almost, as it seemed to Lord Lambeth, an impressiveness. Attempts at impressiveness always made him feel awkward, and he now began to laugh and swing his stick. "'Ah, you would have been sure to know,' he said. And then he added, after an instant, "'I'm sorry I'm not a better specimen.' The young girl looked away, but she smiled, laying aside her impressiveness. "'You must remember that you are only a beginning,' she said. Then she retraced her steps, leading the way back to the lawn, where they saw Mrs. Westgate coming toward them with Percy Beaumont still at her side. "'Perhaps I shall go to England next year,' Miss Alden continued. "'I want to, immensely. My sister is going to Europe, and she has asked me to go with her. If we go, I shall make her stay as long as possible in London.' "'Ah, you must come in July,' said Lord Lambeth. "'That's the time when there is the most going on.' "'I don't think I can wait till July,' the young girl rejoined. "'By the first of May I shall be very impatient.' They had gone further, and Mrs. Westgate and her companion were near them. "'Kitty,' said Miss Alden, "'I have given out that we are going to London next May, so please to conduct yourself accordingly.' Percy Beaumont wore a somewhat animated, even a slightly irritated, air. He was by no means so handsome a man as his cousin, although in his cousin's absence he might have passed for a striking specimen of the tall, muscular, fair-bearded, clear-eyed Englishman. Just now Beaumont's clear eyes, which were small and of a pale gray color, had a rather troubled light, and after glancing at Bessie Alden while she spoke, he rested them upon his kinsman. Mrs. Westgate, meanwhile, with her superfluously pretty gaze, looked at everyone alike. "'You had better wait till the time comes,' she said to her sister. "'Perhaps next May you won't care so much about London.' "'Mr. Beaumont and I,' she went on, smiling at her companion, "'have had a tremendous discussion. We don't agree upon anything. It's perfectly delightful.' "'Oh, I say, Percy!' exclaimed Lord Lambeth. "'I disagree,' said Beaumont stroking down his back hair, even to the point of not thinking it delightful. "'Oh, I say!' cried Lord Lambeth again. "'I don't see anything delightful in my disagreeing with Mrs. Westgate,' said Percy Beaumont. "'Well, I do,' Mrs. Westgate declared, and she turned to her sister. "'You know you have to go to town. The Phaeton is there. You had better take Lord Lambeth.' At this point... Percy Beaumont certainly looked straight at his kinsman. He tried to catch his eye, but Lord Lambeth would not look at him. His own eyes were better occupied. "'I shall be very happy,' cried Bessie Alden. "'I am only going to some shops, but I will drive you about and show you the place.' "'An American woman who respects herself,' said Mrs. Westgate, turning to Beaumont with her bright, expository air, "'must buy something every day of her life. If she cannot do it herself,' She must send out some member of her family for the purpose. So Bessie goes forth to fulfill my mission. The young girl had walked away, with Lord Lambeth by her side, to whom she was talking still, and Percy Beaumont watched them as they passed toward the house. She fulfills her own mission, he presently said, that of being a very attractive young lady. I don't know why I should say very attractive, Mrs. Westgate rejoined. She is not so much that as she is charming when you really know her. She's very shy. Oh, indeed, said Percy Beaumont. Extremely shy, Mrs. Westgate repeated. But she is a dear good girl. She is a charming species of girl. She is not in the least a flirt. That isn't at all her line. She doesn't know the alphabet of that sort of thing. She is very simple, very serious. She has lived a great deal in Boston with another sister of mine, the eldest of us, who married a Bostonian. She is very cultivated, not at all like me. I am not in the least cultivated. 
She has studied immensely and read everything. She is what they call in Boston thoughtful. A rum sort of girl for Lambeth to get a hold of, his lordship's kinsman privately reflected. I really believe, Mrs. Westgate continued, that the most charming girl in the world is a Boston superstructure upon a New York Fonds, or perhaps a New York superstructure upon a Boston Fonds. At any rate, it's the mixture, said Mrs. Westgate, who continued to give Percy Beaumont a great deal of information. Lord Lambeth got into a little basket phaeton with Bessie Alden, and she drove him down the long avenue, whose extent he had measured on foot a couple of hours before, into the ancient town, as it was called in that part of the world, of Newport. The ancient town was a curious affair, a collection of fresh-looking little wooden houses, painted white, scattered over a hillside and clustered about a long straight street paved with enormous cobblestones. There were plenty of shops, a large proportion of which appeared to be those of fruit vendors, with piles of huge watermelons and pumpkins stacked in front of them, and, drawn up before the shops or bumping about on the cobblestones, were innumerable other basket phaetons, freighted with ladies of high fashion, who greeted each other from vehicle to vehicle and conversed on the edge of the pavement in a manner that struck Lord Lambeth as demonstrative, with a great many, "'Oh, my dears!' and little quick exclamations and caresses. His companion went into seventeen shops. He amused himself with counting them, and accumulated at the bottom of the phaeton a pile of bundles that hardly left the young Englishman a place for his feet. As she had no groom nor footman, he sat in the phaeton to hold the ponies, where, although he was not a particularly acute observer, he saw much to entertain him, especially the ladies just mentioned, who wandered up and down with the appearance of a kind of aimless intentness, as if they were looking for something to buy, and who, tripping in and out of their vehicles, displayed remarkably pretty feet. It all seemed to Lord Lambeth very odd and bright and gay. Of course, before they got back to the villa, he had had a great deal of desultory conversation with Bessie Alden. End of LibriVox section 2